So hey everybody, this is John again, and I've brought my model brain and uh, putting it together to talk to you a little bit more about anxiety in the brain. And so one of the things that is most interesting about uh, treating anxiety and talking to people about anxiety is that there's kind of two roles, that has two areas that need to be treated. And if you kind of think of the brain as kind of like a computer, it's not exactly like a computer, but it does operate as a form of a computer. If you think about it as that kind of capacity, you have to think about how cognitions are kind of like software. When we talk about the SRC model, the stimulus response consequent is a constant scripter and rescriptor. It's kind of like an update method for the software of the brain, right? And then we talk about the hardware of the brain, which would be the neocortex, you know, the forebrain, the midbrain, and the hindbrain, and how all of these different structures interact uh, to get data, information, and behaviors out there. So <clears throat> in our previous uh, video that I did, we spoke specifically about the amygdala and their role in anxiety. And so uh, we discussed, and just for recap, that everything comes through the thalamus and then goes up into different parts of the brain. Okay, And so when we do that, uh, we, we know that this is Grand Central Station and that there's an amygdala near the front of the brain, uh, right in this area. I'm putting my finger on it right there. And that amygdala, meaning almond, is an almond-shaped organ that puts things out. But we focused a lot on the amygdala last time. So what is the role of this, this nice neocortex, that new brain? What role does this brain play in anxiety and PTSD triggers? Now, in an earlier video, it may have sounded like everything was up to the amygdala. And that is true when it comes to causatory actual triggering. That is the organ that's going to tell the rest of the body that there's a threat. <clears throat> However, there is a role that the neocortex plays. And as we examine the brain, we have, let's see if I can put our two halves together. There they are. I got the puzzle together. Um, and that's a neocortex thing, right? Figuring out how things fit together. Um, so we have this nice little brain here. Now, the neocortex, I know many of you have heard of uh, right brain the right brain and the left brain. Now to you it's opposite, right? Because I'm looking into a camera. But the right brain deals a lot with imagery and artistic expression and creativity. So there's a lot of imagination here. And on the left side is a lot of more logical, organized thinking. So left brain, right brain. And so some people are more oriented, either left brain or right brain. So a lot of your artists are very right brained. And a lot of your uh, accountants and scientists and physics and things are more left brain so uh or left you know not necessarily dominant because they're both working at the same time however there are some affiliations there that <clears throat> kind of show that one side is 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 the is a more dominant or predominant uh part of the the human condition so those elements play a role in anxiety now the neocortex as we'd covered in an earlier vi video this brain this outer brain the forebrain, does not itself cause anxiety. If you're thinking of actually sending a signal to the adrenal glands and things like that, that is strictly the purview of the amygdala. Now, if we look at the amygdala, instead of being something that just receives information and then sends out information or responses, think of the amygdala more like a monitor. Someone who's sitting there watching television screens and seeing all kinds of sensory data come through. But it's also monitoring what's going on in the neocortex. Remember, in the earlier video, just for recap, you remember that there were more connections between the amygdala to the neocortex than from the neocortex to the amygdala. And so this is an important thing to know because when this is the left brain that I'm holding right here, the left hemisphere, and this is where a lot of logical uh, conclusion stuff is taking place, especially in this nice, rich frontal lobe. Um, this is the newest part of the new brain, you know, the most advanced part evolutionarily. And this is where a lot of uh, thinking takes place. A whole lot of thinking takes place here, including emotions, which are way down in here. So, um, but then you also have motor function. You have the parietal lobe, right? You have the, the you know, the parietal lobe, but you also have, you know, motor function is this nice dark blue. Um, and then there's some other areas, speech and other things that are taking place. 
uh, mostly motor function is taking place in this part of the brain, which is right behind the um, frontal lobe. So you have the parietal lobe and then the occipital lobe and the temporal lobe where a lot of hearing and stuff comes through. Okay, so this part does a lot of thinking. And since it's the left hemisphere of the brain, we know that this is going to be a lot of logic, a lot of processing of, of figures and numbers and sequences and things of that nature and of course I gotta have my caffeine so hold on it's way too early to be talking without caffeine <clears throat> and I make that that's army strong coffee so if you ever come to my house be prepared if you drink coffee for it to uh, hit you kind of hard so we put the brains back together and we go to the right brain okay so now we have the right hemisphere and in this brain we have a lot of imagination now here's the thing, when the amygdala, or the amygdala in each hemisphere, where are we? We're in the back of the brain, here we go. When we're in this part of the brain, right here, um, there you go, well that's the thalamus, but it's right in front of the thalamus, if I can figure out my coordination. Um, when we're looking at that, it acts more like a monitor. So it's not only watching information that's coming up the spinal cord uh, into the thalamus and going on, it's monitoring everything that comes through there but it's also monitoring everything that's happening up here, especially in here. Remember earlier when I told you that the amygdala is really close to the frontal lobe? It's monitoring everything that's going through, and both amygdalae, the amygdala of the right and left hemispheres, are monitoring what's going on up here. This, this is the frontal lobes of the uh, right and left hemispheres. And so as this information is being processed and shared, um, back and forth, it's monitoring. Now, what does that mean? What that means is, is that we are capable, that nice neocortex, that advanced part of our brain, is where we can imagine things. We can, we can create imagery in our minds, kind of like a daydream, right? We can create images, sounds, and things in our minds that are not actually happening externally. But our brain is sending those inf that information to parts of the brain that deal with vision and hearing and taste and sound and smell and so on and so on and so on, right? So what does that mean? It means that the amygdala doesn't distinguish between the information coming from the external world and the information coming from the cortex. And it will react as if it sees a threat, even if it's only coming from right here. You see, so when we're stuck with things like OCD or we're up, we have obsessive thoughts over catastrophe, we're always expecting catastrophe and we're imagining that catastrophe happening, guess what happens? The amygdala sees it and says, oh, threat. And then all of a sudden you have a bodily anxiety re re uh, reaction because the amygdala thinks what you've imagined is a real threat. It cannot distinguish between what's imagined and what's real like this part of the brain can. It's a very primitive part of the brain. This is the old, this, these are the old structures of the brain that have been around through eons of evolution, starting with the most basic animals, which just only had heartbeat and breathing, right? And going up to animals that had uh, more instinctual concepts, you know, anger, fight, flight, survival stuff, all coming into here. And then a, a cortex began to develop, and then the more advanced cortexes uh, resulted. So this is, the midbrain is a very old, primitive part of our brain. It's still the animal part of us, really, right? Where this part is thinking of philosophy and physics and is designing rocket ships and great buildings and is creating complex societies and uh, political things and all kinds of stuff. Where this is doing all of that, this part can't do that. It just sees zeros and ones on and off. So if what's imagined up here is seen by this as matching one of those codes we talked about from learning, you know, the, the SRC model where the consequences, you know, related to the response, the stimulus is all related. So they, they it can anticipate a threat and act before this brain has time to think on it in order to survive. So what happens is, is it's monitoring and it sees us imagine ourselves in a car wreck. How many of you have been sitting there going, God, I wonder what it would be like to be that person who got in a car wreck and got hurt. And then you imagine yourself being in the wreck and then all of a sudden you kind of feel your heart rate increasing. 
because you're actual that's that's actually a sign of good empathy right because you're seeing that environment through the eyes of another person and you're responding to it as though you are that brain behind the eyes right so that that is that's a response to a reality that's not external it's it's a reality constructed by the brain but the amygdala reacts to both and so you can find yourself Let's say you're taking a class. Uh, I don't know. Let's say you're listening to Mr. John Duffy's class on neuropsychology or, or biopsychology and the impact on behavior, right? I don't know. I'm making something up here. But let's say you're listening to me right now, but the whole time you're listening to me, you're also thinking about writing the check or paying some bill you're behind in or uh, are you going to pay the bill and you know once you pay that bill, how are you going to pay for groceries, right? So you're, you've got that in the back of your mind and you start imagining yourself trying to pay for groceries and not having the money for the groceries and then the embarrassment that you feel affiliated with that if, if the card goes rejects or so these are things people think of and as you're imagining that all of a sudden you find yourself having a panic attack or an anxiety attack and that is because again the amygdala who's monitoring imagery rather it be imagery from the external world or imagery from the internal or from the neocortex it is going to respond and now all of a sudden you're having this response of the threat of being denied food or or things that you need for your children and things of that nature um, or you've had an argument with your your loved one your significant other and then you go into a conference somewhere and you're trying to focus on the guy or the girl who's, uh, the, the lady or gentleman who's up there speaking and, and the only thing you can think of is I'm gonna wring that fool's neck or I can't or, or you're focusing on the hurt of what your partner said and so now that's triggering anxiety or anger response. Anger response is also a part of the amygdala, which is why a lot of men, when they're scared, respond with anger when they're really scared. So all of you people who are out there, I just gave you a really good clue on relating to your husbands. Your husbands, men, will often turn fear into anger. Remember, it's fight or flight or freeze, right? So in many cases, when, when, when they're scared, they're going to respond with anger. They're going to respond with a fight response, whereas a lot of women will respond with a what? Flight response. They're going to want to avoid the situation. They're going to want to uh, temper it down or try to de-escalate the situation, whereas men are going to escalate almost immediately. Boom. Um, and, and the next thing you know, they're out in the parking lot throwing, throwing swings, right? And hoping the cops don't show up on it before they can get out of there. So, and, and that's how it works. So, um, the neocortex does play a role in your anxiety, but it does not. It is impossible for this part of your brain to trigger the anxiety response. It's triggered solely by the amygdala. And again, what are we doing? When we're talking the language of the amygdala, we have to do experiences. It has to see experiences and, and begin to disassociate the experiences that are similar to the actual stimulus, the conditioned stimulus. They have to be able to disassociate and extinguish the conditioned stimulus so that there's not a conditioned response that is uncomfortable. And so we do that again. There's, there's uh, desensitization techniques. There's EMDR. Uh, which seems to have some really good research with it. I don't use EMDR. Um, I use the traditional good old uh, systematic desensitization process, but I do know people who use uh, EMDR and that they've seen a lot of good re results with their, their clients. So they're, they're, it's basically, if we're going to speak the language of the amygdala, we have to speak the language of experience, stimulus, response, and consequence in order to uh, help the amygdala make the corrections it needs to make so that it's no longer making erroneous anxiety uh, signals to the body. We can't just logically sit there and say, "You, this, is, this really isn't happening, so I shouldn't feel this way, therefore stop. It just doesn't work that way. And I know all of you out there who are watching this who have had anxiety uh, uh, attacks, panic attacks, anxiety, chronic anxiety issues, you know that just saying simply stop it's not going to stop. <laughs> it's just not going to happen because anxiety is being triggered by those amygdala and they don't speak in terms of logic and reasoning. They speak in terms of threat or no threat, on or off switches. And that kind of speaks kind of like a binary code, ones and zeros. It either sees a one or it sees a zero. It's either a threat or it isn't a threat. If it's a one, then we have threat response, which would be, you know, fight, 
flee or freeze, right? And then why would we freeze? In some cases, you can see a threat and you can freeze while you're behind a wall. And the threat can move on by. And so freezing is protecting you, right? If you didn't freeze and you decided to run, then what's not aware of you would be aware of you and come after you. Or if you decided to fight and it's something that will easily overcome you, both of those options are not going to help you. So why do we freeze? Because we freeze in an environment where we're not necessarily going to be seen and the threat can pass us by. Once it's passed, we go on. It's that simple. So that's why there's three Fs, right? Now, um, I hope that helps. I think it will help you. I mean, because if you look at the video when we're talking about the neuroscience of anxiety, uh, an earlier video that I did, and it talks about the amygdala, it talks about the two pathways to anxiety, and now we're talking about the how the neocortex plays a role in your anxiety. So your thoughts and what you imagine in your head, all those catastrophes that you imagine, are now going to come out, uh, are going to be monitored by the amygdala, and they're going to respond as though that is a real uh, event happening rather than something that isn't. Now, if you put, you add that to like people who have been uh, chronically exposed to trauma, domestic violence, combat, things of that nature, where the amygdala actually change form, they're larger than what they should be normally, then that means they're hypersensitive, right? Hyperreactive and overreactive. So that means that, you know, what would normally, you might be able, the amygdala would normally dismiss as an imaginary thing is now being, you know, very hypersensitive means it's overreacting. So it's not only going to react to triggers that would normally not be a trigger, but even if they're just thought about, even if it's just a memory, right? Um, it's also going to overreact, which means your body's going to get flooded as though a dinosaur was about to eat you when in, in fact, in reality, that level of threat wouldn't warrant that level of response. So this is where your anxiety gets really bad. Your panic attacks get really bad. And, and you're literally huffing and you're thinking you're having a heart attack and you're just reaching out to anybody to talk about and get help, um, even though there's no threat there. And, and the, you're, you're sitting here telling yourself, oh, I, there's nothing wrong with me. There's not, there's no threat. Where's the hell the threat? Why? And you, I've even had clients where they would bang their heads. They would get so frustrated with themselves. They would actually hit themselves in the head. Doesn't help because when you're going into the logic mode and the reasoning mode, the only thing you're talking to is yourself, you're, you know, that, that, that nice, pretty neocortex. And we're not talking to the amygdala. So it takes some, sometimes some chemical stuff, um, to assist for a temporary amount of time you might take something like Zoloft or Prozac or Paxil or Cymbalta, uh, a number of antidepressants that have anti anxietal uh, properties to them um, to, in order to get some serotonin levels up because that does have an impact on the central nervous system and how it responds to perceived threat. Um, but that's temporary. As you learn the, the SRC, as we go into the CBT and we go into uh, desensitization processes with you, uh, you'll then begin to develop your own skills, <clears throat> your own sense of self-efficacy. And from that, you will be able to take charge and reduce your symptoms, if not eliminate them, and eventually also come off of any medications you're taking in the interim. Um, so anyway, uh, this is John Duffy with the Alabama uh, Institute for Behavioral Health. Uh, working proudly now with Dr. Michelle Sanchez, who we are now coming together to create one practice together. And it's, it's a growth. The Institute is beginning to grow, and I'm, I'm very proud of that. So until later, uh, we'll, we'll talk about some other things in the future, but I hope you have a blessed day. Bye.